Well, we're gonna, good afternoon again. I'm going to do this sort of backwards because now fresh in your mind that what Lloyd was speaking to him about bail and coding. And we, we wonder uh, why we're seeing this phenomenon of, of bail and coding. And part of the phenomenon, as explained to me in the federal court case, is that we have traditionally used coatings that were thinned or diluted with a, we used to call it solvent. We used to call it thinner, but we don't do that anymore, do we? Because you can't have all sorts of compounds, particularly in closed spaces, even in open spaces. So our traditional methods of prep, white metal prep or surface prep, have given way to a problem because we are now using or have used uh, non-salt-free abrasives to clean the bottom painting. You go to the welding shop, you go and get your abrasion, and you don't know that it's totally salt free. And when you are blasting, you leave behind some soluble salts embedded in the surface at 150 PSI, whatever it was, and then you coat over it. And then that reacts, doesn't get dissolved by the, by the um, solvent media. That reacts and causes <clears throat> corrosion under the coating. And that grows and eventually you lose the coating. We, we had this happen on two warships, um, happened to be in the same shipyard, same media, um, uh, same application, same mill spec coatings, same boat, same time in the water. And uh, these ships had had a history of electrolysis issues, so initially we thought that's what it was about. And it was nothing like that was it about. It was that the um, sodium crystals soluble salts had come through the coating allowing the water to get through the primer into the surface and causing millions and millions hundreds of thousands anyway of tiny pustules and we ended up they ended up taking the coating off twice and reapplying it and the same failure both times and leading to that and taking nothing away from richard parks because we had mentioned it <clears throat> How do you measure and know if there are, if there's soluble salts on the surface of the material, the white metal? And how do you know what the roughness is? Well, you can measure that with a roughness gauge. How do you know it's a pit depth? You can do that with a pit gauge. How, how do you know if there's no salt? So this is in industry, but this is the instruments that I own. And compact, you, a certain methodology, and you'll see this in another type of instrument. You stick a circle on it with the diaphragm on it. You inject it with a known liquid that has a known conductivity measured in microsiemens. And then you extract that liquid after it's had a chance to dissolve the salt. And you put it in the meter, and the meter reads what it is, what the temperature is, et cetera, what the conductivity is. Then you know if the surface has been properly cleaned. The advantage to this meter, which happens to be the Felsco, is that do you need to own, you, you need to own a, um, a UT instrument so you can know what the thickness is. You need to have, no, again, a coating thickness. Probably you need to own a density meter. And you, you certainly need to own a soluble salt meter. And this same head will work with those five other instruments. You have one head and five attachments, as opposed to five complete instruments. And it cuts down the cost tremendously. By the way, this is so simple that, you know, right here, it doesn't even have instructions that you have to be able to read. It does it with pictures, all right? That's the universal language. If you can't figure this out, you're in real trouble. So it, it's simple to the point, and, and it does a lot of things, and it's a service that we now use any time we're going to do go to a boat to see this and prep for coding. For coding. Um, you, you've all read or, or know today, if you didn't already know about uh, registered marine coding inspectors, which is another field in, in licensing to itself. And my feeling I have to be backed up that this instrument. Not to take anything away from the hand and end, will take care of all the needs of, of a normal registered inspector in one kit. 
All the all the tools are one master. <clears throat> well, having said that, let's talk about tier four. Everybody know what a fuel tier is? Well, in 1994, the EPA and the Clean Air Act um, decided that we were going to study what we had to do to start lowering pollution to a near zero level. Eventually, we were going to get there. We were all around in 1994. Does anybody remember that act being put in place? I, I didn't. Okay. You all heard, you, we now know about that time, there were emission control stations. You had to have your car inspected, something you didn't have to do before. And if it didn't pass, you didn't get to go right back, retro right back. You had to fix it to whatever that standard was at the time. If it was 500 parts per million uh, contaminant, hydrocarbon contaminant, it had to be. You had to fix it to the, to the tier that it was when it was built. In the long term of this deal, there were going to be four tiers. Now, let's think about this for a minute. How many years ago in 1996? Long time. This has been a gradual process. It has been fought, fought its whole way. We want to extend it, we want to extend it, we want to extend it. The manufacturers can't build anything that clean as fast. Um, some of us, when John was there, <clears throat> there, ooh, probably 2004, when a representative from Honda said, we cannot make an engine that will survive at 15% ethanol. You were there. Right? And that's what Honda said, we can't do it. Well, clearly they have done it. And is it as powerful? No, but it's taken a long time to get there. So what we have here, we um, started with non-road engines, which is what we look at. But non-road is also cranes, bulldozers, um, trail handling equipment, mine handling equipment, excavation, and boats. Non-road engines under 37 kW to 175 kW. They raise it again. We got to 506 kW, 60 kW, then we got to 900 kW. Pretty much all encompassing for what you see in smaller recreational vessels. Is this the button I'm pushing here? There we go. All right, there we go. Perfect, thank you. Well, you know, it was never going to happen. We were never going to be faced with tier four. There was always going to be another extension. We didn't have to worry about being able to measure this, whatever the combustion gas is worth. It was never going to happen. It's happened. And it's going to happen in about a week. January 24th of this year, it was passed. It's been around for 10 years waiting to happen. It's now happened April 1st. I don't know how you gentlemen feel about it, but my sense is if I don't have the equipment to measure what the emission is, now knowing now that it's a requirement, it needs to be in my report that I don't have the equipment or I didn't measure to see if the engine is in compliance. So part of this is we inspected a luxury yacht, fast luxury yacht, with Queen Myanmar diesel, high-speed diesel, that on the EPA plate on the top of the engine said compliant to tier three, 2014. I can't test that. So when it, when it arrives in California next week, and faced with an absolutely demonic level of scrutiny that you get in California for imports. And he comes back and says, you didn't tell me it wasn't in compliance in 2014. I can't run this boat in California until I do $20,000 of modification. Right? We don't get to ship boats overseas or inspect them that might be going to the UK unless we inform the client that we didn't test the bottom paint to see if it has any constituent of tribunal tin in it. Because if it arrives in Europe and it's got tribunal tin in it, in Italy, I think it starts at $90,000 fine. It's, it's outrageous. But we don't tell people about it, and we certainly should. So I'm expecting when this bike gets to California, 
if someone actually measures it, it will not meet 2014 tier three uh, requirements. <clears throat> you can go online and all kinds of charts, um, situations that you can look up what the percentages ought to be at what temperature, at what horsepower. Generators get a bit of a break. Um, What am I doing over here? There we go, got it. So April 1, things go into effect. And we are shooting for 90% reduction, basically, in all fluids, but sulfur in particular. Uh, and nitrous as well. The rules in California do not overarch the rules as established by the EPA for 2004, 2018 Tier 4 but they add to them in different ways. So, and, and I'll put this in here, not as a joke. California considers electricity a fuel. It is in electric cars and bikes, isn't it? You pull up to a charging station just like you pull up to a pump. So there are regulations on charging stations as if it was a gas pump because you're delivering a fuel. There are regulations for propane, LP, LPG clearly, CNG, uh, diesel, JP4, on and on. There's a regulation, a different set of regulations for what it ought to be. But we need to know what that is because we're going to inspect vessels that need to be mandated. And the 2018 boat, you're going to inspect this frame. If you can't test it, you can say that the, the plate said that it was verified the 2018 standards. But my feeling is I better mention it so that the customer at least is aware that we have a, a potential for a problem. And, and you know, somebody in California is gonna catch on and say, have you had your boat inspected recently? And, and people will buy it. Questions on it? You're telling me that you have to have a boat now inspected here for emissions as of April 1st. California. Yeah. Not for anywhere else. Not, not, the, all, everything's sold after April, January 24th, and then for us, January 24th, that claims to be tier four, and it ha has to be to tier four. In other words, someone sells an engine now, as of April, uh, January 24th, it must be tier four, according to the EPA rule. Using a little more Caterpillar recreational motor. They just they got out of it. So they're, they're selling product, but it's still right. probably for ten years. Well, here we go. The so, motors anyway. They're not yeah. So, so it's anything made after January twenty fourth, marketed after January twenty fourth. Right, because they said if it's built in, if the engine, it's because there's engines in the warehouse. Sure. That are not. Right. But so anything manufactured after the April first date must meet your no, anything sold after January twenty fourth. So you're not allowed to sell out of compliant old stock. You can modify with the number of well, so no, anything no. in stock has to be meeting tier four. That is sold. Okay. The, the engine doesn't have, let me clarify that a bit. The propulsion doesn't have to be to tier four. The emission has to be to tier four. So you can add a, a catalytic converter after the engine. Right. I mean, every gasoline engine built, I think every gasoline engine has a catalytic converter on it. The engine itself is not pure. You can reburn it, but the catalytic converter takes care of it. Same thing as your car. And you can scrub it. So you can have a diesel engine that was tier, tier one. As long as it's coming out the pipe, it met tier four. Is that, is that clear? So it's... Something to know. But no one can measure it right now. I'm sorry? No one can measure that right now. Oh, certainly there is. I mean, there, you, you, can, you can go to um, uh, Enzo K, Enzo X, and, and buy combustion gas measurement from and do it. I mean, the engine on a, on a common rail, electronically controlled, it, has an exhaust sensor and, and places the parameter. And that's how it can, how it can <laughs> regulate the fuel quality. Quantity, just like your automobiles, you got a knock sensor. 
So there's nothing strange about that. It's, it's in a dry section of the exhaust, clearly. Yeah. So you need to, the, the engine needs to know what its uh, um, exhaust gas temperature is, HGT. Uh, it needs to know what the flow rate is, what the contaminant rate is, what the, what the uh, um, a back pressure is. It needs to know that thing in order to work properly. But that's the date. January 24th, it became law. April 1st, it becomes implemented next week. Is that all fuels, diesel and there, there's, all fuels have different sets of regulations, though, but they're, yes. I mean, the, the, the tier four regulation for natural gas is easily met. And, and we can be certain, I, I can be certain, that part of the reason we now have LNG powered shipping is so that they can meet, meet, the, control, meet the control standard. You have almost no particular contaminant in the slip of the parts of the engine. They only run an LNG when it's like 10 miles off the beach to the shore. Is that yeah. right? Is it 10 miles? And then they're going ahead and bump over the LNG. Uh, so the, the volume of, of LNG is only just it's a very limited amount of, of area that they're running. I think it was marine trade or maritime news that had a fully LNG, LNG powered ship. Built over Something like that. So that's what I know about tier four. And, and I've you know, John has been in the marina business forever and ever and ever. As well. You know, when they told us they were going to come into our shops and look at our logs or how we disposed of our MBK and our paint, where did this can of paint go? Where's your schedule when you got rid of it? I said, nobody's ever going to do that. But they sure showed up in an and did it. And they cleaned them out. You are now, you know, we went to West Marine or wherever it was, Seven Seas. You bought 156 gallons of paint. When did you dispose of the paint cans? You've only got 30 left. There's a fine for every one of those 126 gallons of paint that you didn't dispose of properly. Now, this tier four is to bring up the E15 for that? Sorry? Are they bring back the E15? Yes. E15? It's a standard for what E15, what the rate of burn ought to be, or the pollution level ought to be. You can't run a code in California lakes anymore without California burning. Yeah, all that, all inboard gas pumps have to be right. And unfortunately, this lecture, like not the 2014, there's, to my mind, you have to do a major upgrade because there's no room between the, the engine and the transom to fit a catalytic converter. Right, there's none, some of these engines have room to only have room to fit in the exhaust and the risers. Inboard for me, yeah, it's going to be right. So we're, we're going to have the electric boat people here in just a moment. So we might mill about. And um, if you have any questions on tier four that I can answer or this type of instrument, um, so that issue that you have, that one you were telling about the other day, it's like $2,200, where you can do surface scale and looking for... When this one's rigged, this particular instrument's rigged, I did have a, um, I do, do have, I'm turning it, a coatings meter yeah. that, that goes to two and a half, two and a half inches of coating is what it'll shoot, now dual path. And to my mind, I'm never going to do another dry dock. Right. I'm not going to know the barge surface without having to on it. So I don't need that. What I need that, what I need is another um, UT. I need a pit meter. I need a roughness scale. I do need that. And so this instrument will be about $2,200 with five functions. Less than UT also? I'm sorry? Again, with, with, with another attachment, yes. And you can slip it on your belt when it makes noise. Well, will it repaint? Yeah, repaint. What brand? This is a default scale. What we're going to see tomorrow is, is uh, for this purpose of soluble salt, to my mind, the um, Hen and K is a better instrument and certainly faster than this one for measuring soluble salt. But that's what it does. It may, it, it's more task specific than this, which is <laughs> more attachments for your drill bit. Just different structure, different size. John just bought a new UT meter. Right? I did. What did you buy, John? Six. 
Let's take a bit of a break. That's why I got the coffee. I'm going to wait for the boat guys to come. Thank you. That's what they're telling me. Oh. And have a variety of heads. Yeah, yeah, you gotta have the panels. What's that got? Damn, what's that? Humidity in there now? This this is um soluble salt. That's the, that right there is sweet soluble salt. Air soluble salt. No, you, you take an instrument like this or right. a little diaphragm here. Yeah. And it gets we're gonna melt here, but if we did, it's gonna then they might have bring those in here. We've got these diaphragms deals that go in the center of that. Right. So you take your test fluid, right? You turn the needle on. You take your hypodermic right. needle. You blast a new value liquid in here in that region. That's your first first that's your baseline kind of thing. Then you inject this against the surface, agitate it. It dissolves whatever salt is there. You then extract it with that in the meter, and it reads a difference. Real simple. Because the positive takes 6,000. Yeah. Yeah.